and you don't have a green room to access. Okay. Okay. If you just drop, it says you're actually in the session at the moment. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've managed to locate him. He's in the session. If we're just waiting for him to join the greeting room. Welcome back. It's great to see you all getting involved in what the platform has to offer. All the content from today will be available to view on demand within 24 to 48 hours. So don't worry if you missed something earlier. Let's start our afternoon session with a panel discussion focusing on cloud and multi-cloud approaches. What sparked this topic of conversation is in June this year, with some of you may be aware of or even have been affected by, Fast's CDN outage brought down some of the world's largest websites, including the BBC and Gov.uk. This raised concerns around single solution providers and also brought into question whether relying on a handful of companies to run the vast infrastructure that underpins some of the biggest real estate on the internet is the most effective and secure approach. Learning from this, how does the public sector use the building block of change to transform cloud migration? What challenges will the sector need to identify and then overcome when securing multi-cloud environments? Well, here to discuss this with me are the brilliantly suited panel, Stephen Lawrence, Chief Growth Officer, UK Cloud, Alex Hilton, Chief Executive at Cloud Industry Forum, and Stephen Flockhart, Director of Cloud Engineering and Digital Operations, NHS National Services, Scotland. Remember, this is your opportunity to ask any questions you may have of our panelists and help me make it a proper conversation. So if you have a question, don't be shy. Please use our live Q&A function, which you can find on the right-hand side of your screen. So I'd like to say a big hello to our panelists. And uh, you may have noticed that we've got two Stevens, one with a B and one with a PH on the panel today. So if Stephen Flockhart doesn't mind, I'm sometimes probably going to address you as NHS, Stephen, although um, I'm sure the questions will be obvious. I've got to admit, as we start this panel, gents, that I really am not a cloud expert. And I'm sure that there are many delegates in our audience today who aren't as familiar as you all are. So, uh, Stephen, as Chief Growth Operator, UK Cloud, I thought maybe you'd be perfectly placed to start us off on today's conversation and, and just set the scene for us about the cloud in, in layman's terms. Sure. Um, and, and I don't mind surnames if Flockhart doesn't either. I mean, that might just you know be a military approach to it and we won't get that wrong. Well, I'm Steve, don't mind. Um, so, I mean, I think I think there's three things to think about from, from a cloud perspective. Uh, is the cloud still fits into a physical data center somewhere? So it's not nebulous. Um, so as, for example, are in two data centers, they might be the size of warehouses and then inside those are a range of sort of computers. So that's the second thing, you know, this is um, from a cloud perspective, 
it's it's effectively sharing resource, whether that is network, that, that is compute, whether that is storage, um, and you pay for what you use. Um, and that's the third thing then is it's meant to be um, cheaper, more secure, uh, more flexible, more available than operating that, what they might call on-prem. And that's where some of this multi-cloud starts to come from. You have something that's you might classify that as a nightmare of wiring in a cupboard up to, you know, tiering of data centers like ours or other competitors where we take away the burden of having to operate that, um, secure that, patch that so that you can get on with more interesting things uh, from that sort of perspective. So just carrying on, and I will call you Steve if that's all right. Just just explain a bit more detail what multi-cloud is and how is UK cloud different from public cloud? Yeah, so we, we have a public cloud available, and as it says on the tin, that is available for the public to go to. Um, that might be as an individual or a small, uh, medium enterprise business, um, and you would effectively spin up an instance. You would go to that shared computing and say, I need it for a short amount of time, it might be weeks or it might be months. Um, you also then have what's known as infrastructure as a service or platform as a service like probably a little bit like ordering pizza so you can um, make your own pizza or you can order pizza um, or you can ask actually once the pizza's arrived I'd like some drinks with some friends and the table for it to sort of sit on so depending on where you are through that multi-cloud you either own and operate it all yourself which is on premise that could still be a cloud that's local to you or you can outsource some of that uh, to a provider like ourselves where you're operating it or you've ordered the pizza rather than making the pizza yourself or you start to move up the stack if you like saying i'd like you to do the patching the operating making sure our application is available and that's where you've got the table to present it on it might you might class that as a restaurant um, where you can bring your friends and family for that type of thing so that's what a multi-cloud would be literally public to private on-prem and the areas in between I think the pizza analogy uh, certainly worked very well for me. Thank you for that. Uh, moving on to you, Alex. I I, said, I watched the film that you sent me, Consciously Hybrid, uh, which I really enjoyed, actually. And you say in that that cloud first was originally seen as a money saver, a way of saving millions, but it's not about that really, is it? Yeah, discuss. Um, yeah, thanks, Helen. Uh, it's a very interesting one. Um, I, I'm not a public sector specialist, so I run an, an IT trade body called Cloud Industry Forum. But one of the things that we do uh, on a very regular basis is conduct research to look at what cloud adoption is right, like across both the commercial sector and, of course, we delve into the public sector. Um, the video that I shared with you is something that we actually did with HPE, um, an initiative that they were driving, looking at really what is the balance like of cloud usage across the public sector? And, and frankly, has it worked? And that was really the crux of this whole discussion. Um, back in 2012, 13, I forget the exact date, the UK public sector announced the cloud first policy. Okay. And the principle around that was very straightforward is that all IT services, this was the aspiration, all IT services would ultimately be hosted on a cloud based platform. Now, you know, over the last decade or so, I guess the question really is how effective has that been? And I think to Steve's point, you know, has that been actually a money saver, which is really what one of the biggest drivers was around this one. So the perception at the time, and, you know, I've been doing this job now for the last decade or so, you know, when I was first doing this, we were whiteboarding up with people in these kind of scenarios, albeit then more physical uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. going right well this is what cloud looks like there's an infrastructure there's a SaaS or a software as a service you know that all kinds of subscription services but that was the key to it it was a subscription service so it's a pay-as-you-go type of model and that's the beauty of what cloud can deliver i talk about flexibility agility and scalability those are the kind of the three main tenets of really what cloud services are all about has that delivered for the public sector probably not in fact, I would say definitely not. And our research would really back that up. We're on the journey and things are going well, but I think there's still a way to go as far as the public sector adoption of cloud is concerned. And, and it doesn't have to always be cloud first for the sake of cloud. There has to be a balanced approach that's taken ultimately. And why hasn't it delivered yet, Alex? And are you optimistic it will? Um, I, I think, um, I think honest, honestly, I think the, probably the policy was wrong. Uh, I don't think it was cloud first. I think it should be, you know, a cloud inclusive, if you like, approach, a digital 
approach that we're taking. I think, uh, and I'm the first to applaud the public sector with some stunningly good services. We're all consumers of services, right? At some form of public sector, be that the inland revenue. I renewed my passport a while ago, I renewed my driving license, really, really good services that were very, very easy to use. Government Gateway, which is this com you know combination of different digital services across the public sector has been out you know, for many, many years now, and it works effectively, but it doesn't have to be cloud for the sake of cloud, okay? And I think getting that principle right of, is it a money saver or is it about what are the business needs that the public sector have to address? And can cloud play a part in that? Absolutely, but it doesn't have to be just because it's there because we say cloud is the right direction of travel. Stephen, waiting very patiently there. How has NHS Scotland used cloud services uh, to support the pandemic response? Um, we've made um, we've made very good use of public cloud services for our for our pandemic response. I think primarily we've used it for um, you know areas where we've needed to really adapt very quickly to the situation and a very you know fast changing situation as well. So we've made use of uh, public cloud services for our contact centre, we've um, very quickly stood up, um, you know, cloud telephony services that in a traditional environment, we wouldn't have been able to deliver so rapidly. Um, and we've also used it for um, our mass vaccination scheduling. So we've we've underpinned our, uh, our scheduling system with, um, you know, a, a cloud back end. And again, that's been, you know, very important for us to be able to scale that very quickly. That's one of the advantages that that's given us. Um, you know. And also, what about the challenges for, you know, for citizens and patient groups in, in terms of more services moving online? How have, how have people coped with that in your experience? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's probably been slightly more challenging, I would say, for us. Um, we, we've offered, you know, a, a variety of different digital services and it's not all been, um, you know, we're not trying to force citizens down a, a complete digital path. Um, we appreciate that not everybody is ready for that journey yet. So we we have options available to them that allow us to to say, look, if you want to have your your domestic certificate on your on your phone, we have an app that allows people to do that. And again, that's you know that's underpinned by a, a cloud service that we built that upon. But we also give people the option to you know come onto the website. We use NHS Inform. People can request a copy of their certificate. So those that are maybe not quite as technology literate and don't want to maybe don't have a smartphone, maybe have a phone, but don't have a mm. phone capable of doing that or don't want to carry an iPad with them everywhere they go. And we do offer other, you know, other alternatives to that. And, you know, they can request that or they can download that themselves. So we're trying to balance it whereby we, you know, we have a, a kind of equitable solution for everybody where we're not forcing people down one particular path. Steve, would you enjoy, uh, would you agree with Alex's um, sort of statement there that, you know, not cloud for sake of cloud? Yeah, and, and I think um, being being one of the um, founding members of that government gateway, you know, it, it was it was hosted then um, uh, with, uh, with with cable and wireless in the old British Airways ticketing um, uh, uh, warehouse. Um, and, you know, I seem to remember someone asking me at the time, uh, does anyone in cable and wireless know what an Altian switch is? And I was like, yeah, I do. Right. You're in charge of this really important piece of national infrastructure. Um, and like you say, Alex, it's had a 20 year heritage. And we were starting to talk about some of the early things there about having it in one place. Could could you imagine um, the ability to have sort of cross border identity um, and sort of saying to NHS Scotland, you don't need to worry about the identity yourself. You know, the citizens are already using government gateway. Just link it to that. Speed things up. Um, HMRC and, and renewing fishing licenses, you know, the, the aspects that we're moving into now is about trying to help create that social pr footprint that goes, I've been operating online for the last 20 years, I am who I say I am, and here's the footprint that allows that. Um, so no need to have an additional passport, you know, we saw the paper on the windscreen disappear because now I don't need to tax my car, it's done automatically. Um, so like you say, as, as Stephen said, trying to avoid stuff that's physical for those that don't want something physical. And for those that do want something physical, you can make it available, but you just have fewer of them. So you're trying to cater for those that are in a generation that actually do like to phone. And now what you're doing is those that don't like to phone, they're not holding up the queue for those that do. For someone who doesn't want to carry something around, there's fewer of them for those that do. Um, so you're able to sort of cater from, from that sort of perspective. So I think um, 
you know, government at the time, I'd probably challenge Alex a little um, uh, gently, needed a shock, right? So cloud first, tell us why not. You almost had to put the burden of proof onto the departments or the local authority or the trust or the force as to why are you not then? Because in theory, this is cheaper, better, faster than anything you've got. But, you know, coming from a central policy perspective, you know, you might not have been close enough to knowing why. Do you want to rise to that challenge, Alex? Yeah, I, I think it's very interesting. I, I, I agree, agree with Steve's point. You know, I think the principle around cloud first was a good one. Um, I just think the drivers around it weren't necessarily the right one. Uh, and what, what I mean by that is I think it was approach, the approach around it was a big cost saving thing, but actually public sector, and I'm, and I'm not a critic of the public sector. I'm, I'm actually a big fan of the things that have done. I made that point earlier. Um, but I think, you know, the drive around that, if it was purely cost savings, haven't really been realized because also the financial budgets were really always around CapEx, big capital expenditure, um, you know, procurements that went on. And actually the whole principle around cloud procurement is an operational expenditure one. And I think a lot of public sectors still haven't quite got uh, the heads around how this spend is going to be aligned appropriately. So I think that's a big challenge that organizations have got still. You know, back in the 1980s, dis despite my youthful looks, I was working for ICL, who some of you may remember, now Fujitsu, selling, you know, Series 39 mainframes into the public sector. Um, some of those may even still exist. I really don't know. But, you know, there's still, market, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, there's still a market for this stuff. IBM still sell mainframes, you know. So legacy is seen as a dirty word in terms of, you know, what I mean by that is, you know, is, is it old technology? That doesn't mean it's bad technology. If it works, that's absolutely fine. I work for the Cloud Industry Forum. I'm an advocate of cloud technology, but it's not cloud for the sake of cloud. It's a balanced approach that is right for whatever the particular business challenges that the organization faces. And, you know, you I know you can cloud well, you know, secure cloud services for the public sector, absolutely get that. Great services in there, but there will be some instances where it's not necessary to move to cloud. There might be some highly secure services and I know there are, that the public sector do not ever want to put in a cloud-based environment. Don't want to touch the internet uh, with those things. And I understand that. But the majority of situations can utilize public cloud and use, utilize it effectively. But it has to be balanced based around, based around the business needs. Just to finish off on that bit, Steve, why have UK PS only moved to 10% to the cloud so far? That, that sounds quite low uptake to me. Yeah, and I think, I think it's to Alex's point and probably what challenges Stephen, right, is... I'm, I'm, I'm with Alex, you know, legacy, I'd like to call them classic, um, you know, they, they are dependable. But, you know, that would be one of the questions I have for Stephen is how do you get off the hamster wheel of in two years time refreshing hardware, two years after that having to refresh the software, two years after that having to hard, you know, hardware, when, how, how and when do you kind of get off? Because you have to now touch those legacy or classic systems. I had the same sort of thing at Vodafone. I had 1,500 people in my team, a budget of 30 million, but I couldn't touch 6 million of it because that's where all my classic systems were, my legacy systems. The IT said, no, that's too hard to touch remedy, Steve. That's too hard to stop the double keying between your agents. And so, oh, no, if we touch that, it's going to break. So I think, you know, why hasn't 10% been taken up more? It's probably a better question for, for Stephen to ask because I suspect those are challenges where, you know, big parts of his budget are spent on keeping the lights on. Yeah, Stephen? Yeah, absolutely. I think I can very much resonate with that with that sentiment. I mean, part of the challenge we have, I would say, is, is really, you know, is, is getting the business to, to kind of come along with you on that journey. I mean, it sounds like a slightly corny thing to say, but they do have to buy into it. You know, they're, they're very used to, um, you know, a traditional way of working. And, and I think our, our colleagues in the in the FD space are probably one of the biggest challenges that we have, particularly in the public sector, because, you know, they, they, they like to forecast the capital investment and they like to sweat that asset. And this is a different way of thinking for them. So it, it becomes less about actually is cloud the right answer for them, but it's more about the commercial model and, and getting them in the right headspace to understand that you know, this is more like a rental agreement that you're entering into rather than a purchase agreement. Um, you know, you're paying for the services that you need at the point at which you need them. Um, and, you know, that, that gives lots of flexibility and lots of opportunity. But getting them into that headspace is a bit of a challenge. So that in itself is, is definitely something that we, that we suffer from in, in the public sector. But I think we've actually bitten the bullet on, on quite a number of large scale services. So we're in the process of moving our, our community health index, which is your your single national identifier in Scotland. We're in the process of moving that from a legacy mainframe system onto a cloud-based system right now. 
So we're actually going through the pain of that journey. And as difficult as that is, I think we'll emerge out of the other side of that with a very strong kind of way forward and how we tackle some of those other legacy issues that we've got. So I think sometimes you just have to feel the pain um, in and around you. Excuse the coffee being delivered there. Whoa, that's good uh, service, isn't it? <laughs> We're a bit nice. Yeah, we should story. deliver a full round. Yeah, for everyone. But um, yeah, I think um, once once we emerge through the other side of that challenge, I think we'll find that conversation will get a little bit easier for us to have with some of our other stakeholders who are very much resisting it right now. And Stephen, did you how, how did you get the business case signed off? Because I I can imagine that maybe twenty percent of it was about cost, as in lowering some costs, but the other was about reducing risk, increasing flexibility, agility. What if we had a fire in one of the data centers that's hosting this CHI? And so how, how did you how did you actually get the buy-in? You know, because that's that's always the bit for me is you kind of forget what it's like to be in front of a board member that might not be initiated. Yeah. Um that that in itself, um, we started out um, this business case initially was for an on-premise, you know, hosted application. Um and when I joined the organization um, and my CIO joined the organization just a little bit before I did, we pushed very, very hard for this to be a more progressive kind of modern set of technology. And it was really bringing through some of those points, Steve, that you that you mentioned there, you know, reducing the risk, um, you know, increasing the security. There's a real perception out there that yeah. public cloud is less secure than on-premise and, and, and nothing could be further from the truth in some instances. We're moving much more to you know cloud-based services, and we we still do have that mantra of cloud first, but it's not cloud first at all costs. Like Alex mentioned, this is very much a you know pick the right horse for the course that you run. Um, but we do want to push that that agenda and say if we don't start out from that point and work backwards, then you know we'll always go back to that default option. So we fought very very hard around the the kind of progressive thinking around the scalability and. The, the cost element does come into it, but we're very much on the journey of moving from traditional infrastructure onto IaaS services. That will eventually move into PaaS as it becomes more mature. And in some cases, obviously, we'll move directly to software as a service with, with some of our vendors. So we'll have a very mixed model of that going forward. But I think that, you know the big win for us there was really improving the capability that we could in, increase through the you know use of the public cloud, the scalability and the, and the pace at which you can initiate that change and that scalability you just can't do that with um you know with old style physical infrastructure that that just doesn't happen in the way that we would like it to so that was probably our biggest selling point along with you know the ability for us to basically only pay for what we need when we need it you know if you think about consumption based models we will have parts of our organization where finance have a very large peak at a month end or a year end and we can scale up and prepare for that and then we can dial it back down so we don't pay that cost in a, in a traditional world, we'd buy that up front and pay that cost on the full three-year life of that infrastructure. So, you know, that that's always something that pricks up the ears of the FDs. And then once you get them past that that kind of, you know, pay-as-you-go type model, then it, it becomes a slightly easier conversation, I found. Sounds like you're doing great work there, Stephen, and, and really progressive um, up at the NHS in Scotland. Alex, I didn't wonder if you wanted to comment on what that balance, you know, should be maybe between legacy IT and, and a cloud-first approach. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Helen. Delighted to. Uh, um, I think, you know, firstly, and there's been research, it's not my research, not Cloud Industry Forum research, the research that I certainly picked up on is that some 50% of public sector IT spend is still spent keeping the lights on. You know, I think both Steve has even referenced that as well. And that's quite insightful as well, because, you know, if, if um, that's not necessarily about advancing the business, that's about just keeping the functions going, okay? quite interesting around that one you know the um Stephen, i think referred to as well that there are certain elements of public sector that are if you like seasonal there are, you know can be peaks and troughs around this one hmrc uh, is, a, is a classic one i don't know about you but come the end of january it's a bit of a frenzy in that last week as i have to get my tax return done um you know and and um cloud-based servers you can scale that that's that was one of my three things remember i talked about agility flexibility and scalability that's the scale element around this one you are able to adapt, um, you know, the environment based around the particular challenges that the organization faces at any one time. And I think that's that's a key thing around it. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, I think I'll probably rest it there. I think for the moment, Helen, there's a lot more I can say on that. <laughs> Steve, uh, we've got a question in from Chris Berry, which we sort of touched on a bit, but um, it's our first question of the afternoon. So thank you, Chris Berry, for, for putting this on the platform. Um, why do you think local government organisations have been slower than the private sector to adopt cloud services for their key software applications? Oh, you said Steve. I did. Is that um, all right? Yeah, I think, I think there's probably three things in there. Um, I think first off is from a, a sort of private sector perspective, um, they probably have a higher risk appetite. That doesn't mean that local government won't take risk. Um, when I was working on Government Connect back in 2006, seven, we were looking to bring together DWP with the sort of social services and the key aspects of, of, of sort of local government. Now, they really, really wanted to improve how they were going to get revs and bends and all the benefits done with, with DWP, but there was a security aspect associated with that. So I think that's the second thing is, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not their data, right? There's this, there's this citizen aspect. Um, and my second example of that is, you know, when I was running NHS uh, mail at, at sort of Vodafone, we said we needed to um, look at improving the service by sending some of the data uh, to one of our, um, our high processing um, units in Germany. And it would improve the speed of response of NHS mail by, you know, minutes and, and, and days for some of these things. And it would only be over there for, I think, less than half a second. But even the idea of it being out of the sovereign state for less than a millisecond, even though it would reduce cost, improve service, and so on, was like, no. So I think that's the second thing that local government will struggle with is some of this decision making is out of their hands um, and the private sector kind of have, you know, a little bit direct route to the chief exec, their CISO um, and so on. And, and then the third thing is um, when the sort of chief exec of a private sector organization goes, right, we're doing it. We're spending money on cloud, whatever cloud might be, you know, the whole organization kind of gets behind that, you know, a chief exec for a local authority has three or four stakeholders to you know, bargain with. Um, and they might not have the same sort of dependencies. You know, they could almost in private sector go, yeah, if we reduce the experience to some of our users, we'll take that risk. You know, local government doesn't have really that choice. You know, they can't decide between, you know, clearing away bins and getting rid of graffiti in a pothole and going, what service should we put online? Mm. So I think, but and as you see the pace picking up, then I'll start, I think you'll start seeing local government um, and, and, and the trusts overtaking the private sector. And Steve, where should a public sector organisation start their cloud journey? Uh, probably, I think Steve, uh, Stephen will back this up as well as some of Alex's research. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want to sound trite, but it's st starting with the end in mind. Yeah. It's always a little bit tricky to say what does good look like. That's where you can learn from public sector and from other um, stars like what Stephen's done in, in Scotland as well. So I think starting with the end in mind, I think the second most important thing, again, is what Stephen has done, is get across your stakeholders. Yeah. Um, so there's a way of selling it. And, you know, you're either sold that you can do it or you're sold that you're not. And I think that's where you need some level of expertise and experience that have been through that before, like organizations like us and those that Alex has worked with and, and Stephen sort of depends on. And then you get into the business case. But I think if you're trying to start with the business case before you've done some stakeholder management and before you've done some stakeholder management, you're not quite sure what good looks like. The stakeholders aren't initiated. And then it's a bit like buying a house, you know, they're kind of like, oh, I love the first visit. Now let's get into the detail. So start off with good, get your stakeholders covered, then be ready for the detail in the business plan. Do um, you want to add to that, Alex? Yeah, I, and I wholly agree with Steve's point there. I think you, you, the the sponsorship for any kind of any kind of technology adoption, but certainly a cloud-based one where it's considered new or innovative, even though it's frankly been around for quite a few years now, has got to start at the top. You've got to have that exec sponsorship and buy-in the stakeholders, as Steve puts it, I think, to really, you know, ensure the success of this. I mean, one of the things that's been talked around a long time for cloud technology is this kind of, you know, fail fast attitude. So the ability to go, well, we've got a project running, 
but it's not working. But actually, you know what? We haven't spent a million pounds buying a load of infrastructure that we physically put on premise because it's a cloud-based service and we can close it down and we can move on. Now, nobody likes to fail, but the ability to be able to do this and actually trial this project effectively, there are certain you know real benefits to that. I was just going to, uh, oh, I thought you disappeared there, Stephen. Um, I've still got lots of questions for all of you, but we are out of time. So, um, Stephen, I just wanted to give you the last thought, really. And, you know, I was going to ask you about your plans moving forward, but also I was quite keen to hear about the advantages of joining up health and care from a digital perspective. I sort of feel like you should have the end word and pick what you think would be the most important thing to leave us with really from your experiences yeah sure thank you um i think one thing that we've learned from this is that there is definitely a greater appetite out there from our citizens to consume you know health and social care services in a digital format um it's something that we have been looking at for some time and i think you know there hasn't been a lot of good that has come from this pandemic but we have learned some lessons from it and i think certainly one thing that we have learned from it is is that that desire and that, and that demand does exist and what we are now investing our time in looking at is, well, you know, how do we make those services more consumable for those people in the, in, in those digital forms? So it, it's it's definitely something that we have very much at the forefront now of our, our, our strategy moving forward. You know, how can the government and the NHS in Scotland work together to make those services, you know, come to life and really bring them together as one kind of entry point for our citizens to come forward? Very much like Steve said about you know, the HMRC things that, 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 that he's worked on in the past. We, we have a similar kind of theme in mind for that, that, you know, we have a digital front door that allows our citizens to come in and, and access things like their healthcare records or their vaccination information. You know, we've already started to do that now with the, you know, the vaccination certificates that we're producing for travel and for domestic use. And I, and I just see that growing out further and further from there and more and more services to be able to come online and, and take advantage of that. And, you know, it will not always be the, the one-stop solution for everybody, but it, it is definitely going to be, you know, at the forefront of our strategy moving forward over the next few years. That's a really positive note to end on. Uh, I'd like to say a very big thank you to all of my panellists there for um, an in-depth and an insightful conversation. certainly feel I learned something there, and I hope you found it as useful and fascinating as I did. Well, next, we're going to move on to our last keynote speakers of the day. In this session, Afshin Atari and Jonathan Bridges of Exponential E explore how digital pathology is streamlining workflows and transforming patient care across the UK healthcare sector, enabling more effective collaboration between teams using sophisticated AI and ML to identify trends and opportunities, and ultimately providing more efficient diagnoses. Drawing on their hands-on experience in successful digital pathology initiatives, Afshin and Jonathan will demonstrate the importance of the right technological foundation, some big words in today's conference, and provide a clear vision of how lessons learned can deliver the same transformational results across other sectors. So let's welcome Afshin and Jonathan to our virtual stage. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session. Hopefully, Heather, we can simplify the complexities that you've just mentioned. So um, this afternoon, we'll be talking about accelerating digital transformation in healthcare. If we can go into the next slide, please. Um, I'm Afshin Atari. I'm our Director of Public Sector and Unified Platforms and Exponentially. Um, I run our government business, and I'm supported by Jonathan Bridges, who is our CIO. Both of us are part of the leadership team here at uh, Exponentially. Next slide, please. If we focus on the challenge that we see in the market, really public sector is challenged by delivering best value, increasing efficiencies, but also focusing on outcomes. And I think the focus on challenging dynamics is the one to focus on because this was really centered really before COVID as what we've seen, the dynamics and the market and the conditions have changed significantly over the last two years. So the question is, how do you recreate pathways and enable technologies to deliver better outcomes to the public sector. Next slide, please. So from an authority perspective, at the heart of its operations, really there are two key stakeholders. One is around its employees, how the employees consume those services, but more importantly, it's around the citizens, how citizens engage and how they consume those services. And our aspirations as citizens has changed with the advent of technology, with how we engage with a various verticals, banking, insurance, et cetera, our view around consumption in the public sector has changed. 
But all of that needs to be wrapped around an agile model, which is delivering operational outcomes and accelerating innovation and change. As I've mentioned, over the last two years, we've seen many of that happen. That can be supported by agile working, flexible and, perform, uh, and really focusing performance and future proofing. And this is where sort of the capabilities of cloud and the UC application, hybrid cloud, SaaS, and redesign of pathways come into play. Next slide, please. All of that really is centered and supported by a complex matrix, as you can see here, from security to software defined to applications. And the role of a uh, managed service provider like ourselves is to take those complexities away and translate that technologies into outcomes which can be beneficial to the public sector and in these instances towards the healthcare. So if we go into the next slide, please. The first example I'm going to talk about is how we worked with the prison service in delivering telemedicine. Fundamentally, what we've done is we've delivered a, um, the ability to connect into, H into the HSCN network remotely through secure laptops, through authenticated platforms, through a managed service to deliver healthcare to prisoners in a secure environment, which really came into play at the time of COVID. So if you can imagine, under normal circumstances, a prisoner needs to be transported out of prison to go and see a uh, uh, healthcare professional. In this instance, one healthcare professional can access all of the patient records in uh, a prison and ensure that, that um, the care is delivered, uh, really uh, isolating themselves and ensuring there's no spread of COVID. So this is one of the examples where we've seen the use of technology come into play and support changing and demanding needs over the last two years. Next slide, please. This is a, a second example where we've worked with West Yorkshire Social and Acute Trust. In this environment, what we've done is we've provided a centralized cloud-based resource model where it gives them the ability to access OmniCell and applications, which is a pharmaceutical application, to lower costs and deliver better patient experiences. This again against the six authorities which are listed on this slide. And finally, if I can hand over to Jonathan uh, here, he'll be talking specifically around the example of pathology and leads. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Ashpreet. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, if we could just move on to the next slide, I think one of the key things that we've been seeing, I'm sure many of you who are involved um, in the healthcare side will see that there is significant uh, focus on advancement in human progress around digital pathology and, and actually effective and more AI into the healthcare space. Our focus really has been looking at how we can support organisations to deliver these technologies and capabilities to accelerate that. So if we just move on. When it comes to that, what we've tried to focus on is looking at how we can not only deliver these technologies, but provide a sustainable wrap around that. And as this build moves through, if you just want to click through slowly through it, what we focused on is looking at how we can take green data centers to start off hosting these capabilities to provide the infrastructure to support these digital pathology systems, integrating that into high performance platforms that then can process the data as it comes in from the scanners in the slides um, from the hospitals and actually process them into a platform, but also deliver effective archiving integration to that. What we don't want to be doing is holding all these multi petabytes of data in really high performance systems for a long period of time because the cost associated that with heart is very high. I was lucky enough to join maybe 10, 15 minutes early onto this and I could hear lots of debate and rivalry around what's good to go into the cloud and what's not. But one of the big challenges when you get into these large data types, I mean, this one here is sort of 30 petabytes growing to 150 petabytes is the, the cost associated with egress that sits around that when you start to, to pull out those digital records can be very, very expensive. So what we focused on is the right fit for the right solution to support these large scale out platforms and have a blueprint that can then integrate managed service and protection on those, including looking at how you can deal with cyber recovery of data in the event of ransomware attacks and those kind of pieces. But the real value then sits on top is how you can then actually accelerate putting those platforms in. We always talk about the public cloud as being that accelerated platform to get infrastructure and services up and, and running. But actually by having solution blueprints that integrate uh, standardized technology and services, we can rapidly get these platforms up and running to deliver effective outcomes and patient benefits. If you look at this from a technical perspective, just moving on to the next slide, these are large scale infrastructures that get deployed. 
And you can see here the program we're deploying for NPIC at the moment, which is the National Pathology Service. This really will help um, link up multiple hospitals and give them access to data that can really start to transform the way we deliver patient outcomes. If you think of uh, the opportunity downstream, and I say the opportunity because obviously we, we understand that um, there is uh, legislation that has to happen in various pieces around the AI aspects, but we can foresee a future where someone could very quickly get access to maybe 100,000, 200 of the last liver blood uh, uh, samples that have been done and be able to look and do predictive analytics on what could happen with that, how, how we can predict quicker the outcomes and actually then provide increased level of patient care and responsiveness to that. If we move on to the final slide linking to this, really what uh, digital pathology is going to bring is a much more effective service to our patients. When we talk on the last call, I think, um, I think Stephen was um, heavily focusing on what they're doing in Scotland around patient care, patient activity, getting online records available. These systems, when you link them into the, the network side of things with things like software defined WAN, home working can put information into the hands of the most experienced specialists in the world to be able to look at samples very, very quickly. Gone are the days of three to six weeks or two to four weeks to transfer and modify files and put them around. We can rapidly have these capabilities in the hands of people to diagnose faster and provide better care. But as we move forward, the, the key for this also is about the quality, protecting data, protection patient, patient records, and making sure that we can seamlessly look after that information and make sure we provide that in a secure manner. Our focus, um, as Ashim uh, talked about before, is providing these agile platforms and services to be able to underpin these projects, supported by the likes of Innovate UK, some of the national programs that are going on and underpinned by high performance connectivity and on the HSCM where we provide that um, across the UK into a very large volume of customers to provide that secure transit of the data. But inevitably, the great outcome of such a project and probably why Asha so, and I are very proud to be part of it is, the, is what we can do to increase patient care. And I've touched on that a couple of times, but Asha, if you wanted to close off on, on that, I think there was a few points you wanted to perhaps come on to in relation to the overall picture of us and how we want to support the health industry. Thank you, uh, John. Um, uh, as John mentioned, uh, our role as managed service providers is to really marry the technology together, focus on the outcomes and deliver uh, the right environment with the right conditions in a secure manner to satisfy those needs. Uh, we recognize the uh, ability for uh, agility, um, notably on the back of COVID and the lessons learned and the capabilities that we have in our organization as uh, john mentioned around hscn we're a stage d cnsp our cloud capabilities our managed services has allowed us to really support um, the health market notably uh, one example to pull out is that how we connect um, three-fifths of london and we support the delivery of healthcare to six million patients across the london um, area as one example so I think that's the close of the point and um, I'm, we're happy to take any questions. Many thanks. We're struggling to hear you. Mental E. Thank you both for sharing with us the range of technologies available and how they benefit the workforces across various sectors. Uh, it was really good stuff. With that, we'll move into our last break of the day. One last chance to engage with our speed networking functionality and to see if you're in with a chance to climb your way onto our leaderboard. I'll see you back at 10 past three. See you then.